Many of you here today are SaaS founders in the earliest stages of building a company. But the reality is that 80% of startups don't actually find product market fit. And that means that four out of five founders are not going to find product market fit. And it means that the other one out of five is going to struggle through it and sort of barely find it. But that's just the stats. The reality is that searching for product market fit is actually sort of this crazy emotional free fall. You can trick yourself into it. You can see mirages of it. Uh, it can make you literally sick, actually. Uh, in 2012, at the peak of our own search for product market fit, I lost 10 pounds in three weeks. And I was actually hospitalized twice for panic attacks. I haven't had, product, well, I haven't had panic attacks before or since. So just to give you a sense of the sort of emotional roller coaster that at least we went through in finding product market fit, it can be quite intense. And you know, we definitely misled ourselves in the search for product market fit. This is a picture of us in 2012. That's me and my co-founders, Ilya Calvin and, and Ian. And uh, you know, we convinced ourselves that we were always on the cusp. We were always on the cusp of figuring out what the, the detail was, what the thing was that would suddenly trigger us and flip us over into finding product market fit. But the reality is that we really struggled to find it between June of 2011 and December of 2012, sort of a year and a half of, of misery, which many of you may be going through today. I hope not. And of course, it got better from there. Uh, I wouldn't be here today if it didn't. We're now in San Francisco, a little over 100 people, uh, growing very rapidly. But back then, it was just the four of us in an apartment, coding a lot. We had no customers. It was pretty sad. <laughs> and um, the reality was that the only thing that got us through was that we were a bunch of cockroaches. And what I mean by cockroaches is, is that we basically just figured out how to survive. We kept our burn very, very low. And by keeping it low, we just powered through. It gave us the time to test not just one idea, but two product ideas, three product ideas. Some companies do four or five. It's very important to keep your burn super, super low. So we're going to break down this product market fit process into three stages. The first is the sort of search. You're building, testing different ideas. You're putting them out there. And during that time, you want to keep your burn super, super low so that you have time to test the one, two, three, maybe four, maybe five ideas. Then something magical happens. All of a sudden, there's this magic poof, and you discover product market fit, which we'll go into quite a bit in a minute. And then you're suddenly transformed into a sort of unirooch or sunicorn. Um, and everything gets easier. Not easy, but easier, right? Because all of a sudden, you're solving a problem that people really care about. It means that people want to join your team. It means you have customers that show up and want to buy your product. And so for the first time, you really feel like you have this sort of sense of momentum. Right? You're not just pushing this boulder uphill. So today, we're going to talk about finding product market fit. And we're going to break that down into three, three things. First, we're going to talk about we're all here to build category leading businesses or talk about that. So we're going to talk about what is category leadership and how can we deconstruct that into something a little bit more achievable. And then I want to share some stories from the early days of Segment around what product market failure or product market fit, failing to find it, what that really felt like. And then finally, what sort of the magic of product market fit really felt like to us, at least in December of 2012. And my goal is, in highlighting the sort of feeling of these two things, to give you a sense of how you can winnow out the bad ideas and find some of the good ideas earlier on. So let's start by deconstructing category leaders. Why do we even care about what category, like who are they, why do we, why do we bother? Well, the reality is that category leading companies are 10x larger than the other companies in their space. Salesforce is a good example. They're a $50 billion market cap today, $8 billion in annual revenue. And their next closest competitor is something like Sugar CRM or Zoho, these substantially smaller companies, right? So the reason that we care and the reason that we're talking about category-leading businesses is because they're huge. They've somehow created this massive moat around themselves. And so it's worth digging in and understanding how, how do these companies somehow do that? What do they do along the way that allows them to actually create that big, sustainable, long-term advantage? And if you look at most of them, what they've done is they've taken a SaaS product, an initial SaaS product like Salesforce's CRM, and they've taken all their customer data that's being generated in there, and they've turned it into a platform. And that platform allows you to actually build an ecosystem of partners and customers that create this sort of moat ecosystem around you that really makes it possible to grow to that scale. But what is it, what's required to actually go build a platform? Well, Peter Thiel has said that 
In order to build a platform, you need to get to 100 million in revenue. Holy shit, that's a lot of revenue. Uh, and why? Like, why is that important? Well, before 100 million in revenue, you really don't have a big enough market for someone to build exclusively on your product. If, you know, as a partner building on top of a platform, if you manage to get a couple percentage points of the platform's customers and it's under 100 million in revenue, you just you can't, you can't build a sustainable business that way. But by the time you get to 100 million in revenue and you have line of sight to a billion, your partners can actually really start to truly build businesses based purely on your platform. So we know that to be a category leader, you need to build a platform. To build a platform, you need to go to 100 million in revenue. 100 million in revenue is still a long ways away. So how do you, how do you get there? If you aren't reading Saster, you should definitely go check that out online. But the way that he breaks it down is he says from zero to a million dollars in revenue is impossible. From 1 to 10 is improbable, but from 10 to 100 is inevitable. And the reason that 10 to 100 is inevitable, at least in his mind, is that by then you have so much momentum. You have sort of a mini brand. You have so many customers who are hopefully happy and loving the product that growing from 10 to 100 is going to happen eventually unless you, you know, really screw it up. It might take a long time. And then 1 to 10 is improbable because you really, for the first time, you have real scale. You have real customers. You have real money exchanging hands. You have real expectations on your business. But it's still the early team. You can't really build a great executive team, a great management team, until you get to 10 million in ARR. And so for that 1 to 10 million journey, it's a real grind for the founders and the early team. You're pushing through. You're sort of a skeleton crew holding it together through these early stages of scale. And then 0 to 1 million is impossible, because this is the stage where basically almost everyone fails, where 80% of companies fail to find product market fit. And so today, I want to zoom in on this 0 to 1 million stage. This is the impossible stage, the finding product market fit, because it's the foundation of this entire long journey that eventually leads to building, if you succeed, a category-leading company. And so we're going to zoom in on that. And that's crazy, right? Four out of five companies not finding it, one out of five barely struggling through. I mean, that's like a really horrific failure rate. Um, it feels like we ought to do better, right? But the reality is it's actually even worse than that, which is as founders and investors, we often talk about how we learn from failure. But the reality is you know, the studies that have been done on product market fit and failure, it turns out that for founders that fail the first time to find product market fit, they're actually no more likely to find product market fit the second time. It goes from 22% to 23%. That's pretty horrific. Uh, and if you succeed in finding product market fit the first time, then the odds actually go up. The odds actually jump from 22% to 34%, which is still pretty bad, but it's a 50% increase. And so what that means is that there's actually no learning encoded in failing to find product market fit. But there is learning encoded in actually succeeding and finding it, right? And I know for ourselves, we felt this problem really acutely. Um, we basically felt like we could just mislead ourselves based on the smallest amount of positive information. We would see a customer give us some small comment or some little bit of feedback, some vague interest, and we would convince ourselves that this little positive feedback was the beginnings, the beginnings of hope, the sort of something that could grow into real true product market fit. And what we were missing was some example of what really product market fit really, really felt like. Some positive example where we could say, yeah, that's nice, but that's still not product market fit. And so we really needed some sort of positive example to train the machine learning algorithm in our head as to what it really feels like. And so that's what I want to give you today. I want to walk through some of the early history of Segment and, and hopefully give you a feeling of what these two things are like so that you can sort of differentiate between glimmers of false hope and true product market fit. This is a picture of us in 2011. We had just gotten into Y Combinator. Uh, today, Segment is a marketing infrastructure company, but back then, we were building a lecture tool. And we had just left MIT and RISD, and we were sort of wanted to help out our professors and students. And the idea was that we would give students this interface where they could say, I'm confused. And the professors would get this graph over time of how confused the students were. Might actually be kind of nice right now. I could see how can, if I'm leaving any of you behind. Um, and uh, we went around and we pitched hundreds of professors. We really hustled. And we, you know, most of those professors were totally disinterested. We dismissed that as technophobia, right? 
uh, the, ones that, the ones that get it, they know what's up. And so we, we really, you know, we, we felt like these professors that would sort of, were cautiously optimistic that they would, that they really represented sort of the early signs of product market fit. We convinced a couple to try it out in their classrooms. We would come up to them after, right after lecture and we would pitch them on the product right as they finished. But the reality was that in the most cases, they were just doing us a favor. Right? They were like, yeah, I'll help these students out. We'll give them a chance. And that's not what product market fit feels like. That was us just purely misleading ourselves. And to make matters worse, as soon as the students opened their laptops, they just went straight to Facebook. Uh, that's also not product market fit, in case you're wondering. So this was horrifically embarrassing. And it was super obvious from the way that students actually used their laptops in class that we didn't have product market fit. But the professors actually should have been an early warning sign, too because the professors were you know, just vaguely interested in the, the few positive interactions that we had among the hundreds of professors that we talked to. That's not what product market fit feels like. No one was in dire need of the solution that we were offering. So we thought we learned from that. And we went back to the whiteboard, and we said, all right, we're going to build an analytics tool like Kissmetrics or Mixpanel or Google Analytics. And uh, you know, we're going to launch that. We think that there's something amazing that we can build there. And so we started coding. And then true to the sort of lean startup principle, we went out and we started, got out of the building to try to validate it. We had a few conversations with people who expressed sort of like, yeah, you know, I, I, have, I have problems in analytics. I, I have this problem with Google Analytics, and I have this problem with Mixpanel. And so we convinced ourselves that those little discrepancies between what people wanted and what we thought we could offer in analytics was exciting enough that we should actually go build this product. And in particular, a few people said, yeah, you know, I'd love to stay in touch. I'd love to hear how this progresses. And so we said, awesome. They're basically beta users, right? Or on our beta list. That's not what product market fit feels like. So six months later, we moved to San Francisco, and we were still coding. I was occasionally talking to sales prospects. And I would just try to exploit those little differences to convince ourselves that we were really onto something big. It's really easy to do, because you really want to be succeeding, right? Just convince yourself that, hey, you know, these little positive interactions are really good. And there's other examples of these little tiny positive interactions. This is an Olark live chat with a visitor to our website at 3 AM, some sort of sad, sad evening when I was probably up late coding. And you know, he asks a few questions. He or she asks a few questions about how our product works or what it is. And like, this is great. This is like a you know, positive, uh, little positive interaction, right? Someone is really curious and wants to learn about our product. But the reality is it's at 3 AM. It's a six minute conversation. And it ends with me asking a question and them just disappearing. And so when we got to December 2012, we've been working on two broken product ideas for a year and a half. And we realized, all right, this is not working. We clearly do not know what we're looking for. So we decided to go back to YC. And this is us outside the YC office in Mountain View. And we decided to go ask for help. And you know, we're walking around a little cul-de-sac here in, around Y Combinator and sort of bringing PG up to date on everything that we had tried to do over the last year and a half. And when we were done explaining it, he stopped. And he looked at us and he said, so just to be clear, you've burnt half a million dollars and you have nothing to show for it. And that was the absolute pit of our search for product market fit. Uh, it was probably the most brutally honest moment I've ever had in my life. Um, but it was true. It was true. We had burned half a million dollars, and we didn't have product market fit. In fact, you know, we still had 100, 120K left, and that was enough. We said, OK, we get one more shot on goal here. This is our third shot. We get one more chance. So let's pause there, and let's rewind all the way back to the beginning in June 2011, the first week of Y Combinator. And in that first week, we had said, hey, we should have analytics on our classroom lecture tool. You know, we, should, we Googled it, and we found Kissmetrics, and we found Google Analytics, and we found Mixpanel. And we looked at the APIs for those tools, and we saw that they were basically collecting all the same data. But then they gave us different graphs out the other side. And so we said, you know, we don't know which of these tools we're supposed to use. So rather than solving the business problem, let's just solve the engineering problem. We're a bunch of engineers. So we just built this little abstraction that could send data, pull data in in one format, and then fan it out to all three tools downstream. This was just a little tiny code, like a little bit of code in this massive lecture tool that we built. And then a year later, when we were trying to sell our analytics product, we kept encountering this objection, which was someone was already using Mixpanel or 
Kismetrics or Google Analytics, and they'd say, yeah, I just I don't really want to you know, install another analytics tool. It's like a lot of work. And so then my co-founder, Ilya, had this great idea. He said, you know, remember that analytics wrapper we wrote a year ago? What if we, what if we pulled that out, added ourselves as a service, fourth service that it could send data to, and then every time someone comes to us with this little objection, we hit them back with this. We open source it, and we hit them back with this open source library. And so we did that. Um, and people started replying to our you know, objection handling emails. And they'd say, oh, that library is awesome. I'll definitely I'll give that a shot. And so they would use the library. And then a few weeks later, we'd follow up and say, hey, now that you've installed the library, we'd love if you would use our analytics service. Here's an API key if you want to turn it on. And they're like, yeah, whatever, man. I don't really care about your analytics service. And so we basically got to this fork in the road where back in December 2012, we had just talked with PG. And he had been brutally honest with us. And we realized we're definitely going to shut down our analytics tool. But what are we going to do next? And uh, my co-founder, Ian, at the time was like, you know, I think there's actually a really big business behind Analytics.js. And I said, that is literally the worst idea I've ever heard. It's 580 lines of code. It's already open source on GitHub. Like, just explain to me for one second how you plan to build a sustainable business around that. And I couldn't convince the other guys that it was a bad idea. So the next day, I came in and I said, all right, guys, here's how we're going to test this out. We're going to build a landing page. We're going to put a little email sign-up form at the bottom. And then we're going to put it up on Hacker News, and we're going to see what happens. And I was thinking to myself, like, you know, tee hee hee, this will prove them wrong. This is like, going to show that this is total trash. And uh, I couldn't have been more wrong. Uh, it went straight to the top of Hacker News, got a couple hundred upvotes. We got thousands of stars and followers on GitHub in that first day or two. And we started getting these crazy emails from customers. This is actually outreach via LinkedIn. This guy says, what does a brother have to do to get access to the Analytics JS beta? And I'll give you feedback and tolerate bugs like you wouldn't believe. All right, so full stop. This is, that is product market fit. Right? There's like, you can't differentiate these two things. It's not one metric that's like sort of starting to go up. Right? It's this sort of holistic thing of every single metric in your business is suddenly exploding. And when we were on our lecture tool and analytics tool, we kept thinking, like, you know, what, are the, what are the next features that we should build? What, you know, what, do we, what do we build next? But once we had product market fit, it was obvious. Everyone was screaming at us, like, you need to build more integrations. You need to build server-side libraries. It was super obvious. When we were working on our analytics tool and lecture tool, we had written hundreds of thousands of lines of code that no one gave a crap about. Like, we deleted it long ago. I don't think anyone noticed. But now we had built this 580-line code thing that people, it was an elegant solution to a real problem that people had. And when we had been building an analytics tool and a lecture tool, we had these grand visions about what we could build and what we could solve for people, what it could become down the road. But with this, we just solved this tiny problem, right? The tiny problem of, I don't want to install multiple analytics tools. And just solving that teeny tiny problem in an elegant way ended up being compelling to people. And so if you walk away with anything from the presentation today, I want you to walk away with an understanding that product market fit is not vague, positive conversations with customers. It's not glimmers of false hope around some random positive interaction. What it actually feels like is a landmine going off. Right? That's how the Dropbox founders described it. It feels like stepping on a landmine. And so just to summarize how difficult this is, I thought that class metric was going to be this amazing product market fit. It turns out the world didn't give a crap. I thought that segment.io would be this amazing product market fit. And it turns out that the world also didn't care. And then for the Analytics JS, I thought that it was a really bad idea. And it turns out that the world really had a need for it. And so it either goes to show just how hard finding product market fit is, or I guess maybe how obtuse I am. Uh, but I think it's really important that if you do want to find product market fit, if you want to become one out of the five founders that, that does find it, that you not fall into the same trap that we did. Glimmers of false hope are not the same thing as customers just ripping it out of your hands. And all it really takes is being honest with yourself. Thank you. <laughs>